afternoon, friends. Welcome to, to today's Americans for a Safe Israel Zoom meeting. For those who are new to AFSI, we are dedicated to educating Americans about what we believe wholeheartedly are Israel's needs in order to be safe and strong. We have many important activities. One of our best known is our twice yearly Chizuk mission to Israel. We try to get to as many of the places as possible that are experiencing conflict and speak with leaders and others on the ground to hear about the issues and know about the progress that's being made to set things right. Every mission includes a visit to the Temple Mount, a visit to Hebron, and a visit to Ozvagaon, which is now the headquarters of the Women in Green. By the way, registration is now open for our next mission, which begins on May 15th. Today, we have the honor of hosting Nadia Matar, who, along with her partner, Yehudit Katzover, leads the Women in Green. They conceived of and began the movement that fights for the most important need of Israel to be safe and strong, sovereignty. They are blessed to have many brilliant and important supporters. If you are not yet a supporter, I believe you will be after listening to Nadia. So thank you for being with us today, Nadia, and the floor is yours. I bring you Nadia Matar. Thank you, Judy. Shalom to everyone. I just want to check. You can hear me? Okay, yeah. great. So shalom to everybody from uh, Efrat in Gush Etzion, between Jerusalem and Hebron. I see many familiar names and I uh, can't mention all of you. So first of all, thank you, Judy. I see that Leon is here on too. So hi, Leon. Uh, and many <laughs> other friends. I want to first of all, thank you. You, Judy, and Afsi, for all the incredible work you do for Israel. Uh, and thank you for having me here tonight. As you just said, I also represent my co-chair, Judith Katzover, who really is the generator behind all our activities. So dear friends, today's Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the month, the beginning of the month of Adar, the month in which we increase our joy. But if you listen to the uh, Israeli mainstream media, you might think today, uh, after the Knesset vote last night, that today is a day of mourning, maybe Tisha B'Av. So be assured, for the 2,360,000 plus Jews who voted for this government, i.e. the overwhelming majority of the Jewish people in Israel, today is a happy day. I would like to share with you a few lines of a wonderful op-ed that was written yesterday in Hebrew by a commentator called Yotam Zimri, and it was my privilege and fun to translate parts of it into English. So the title of his article is, for the first time in history, the right breaks its sacred agreement with the left. And he starts, I really understand the anger, writes Zimri. I understand the protesters against the legal reform. I understand the media who is in hysteria. I understand everyone because it is not easy to see a slave who for years was given the feeling that he was a slave suddenly goes free and decides that he no longer has a master. Don't be fooled, writes Zimri. What you see on the streets of Israel has nothing to do with the legal reform. It has to do with a simple fact. The right is breaking the historic and sacred agreement it had with the left. And the agreement, which includes about two lines, says as follows, quote, we the right-wing camp hereby acknowledge that even if due to demographic constraints, we manage to win elections, we pledge that even if we come to power, we will not dare to govern and will leave in the hands of the minority, the left, the centers of power that will prevent us from ruling. That is the agreement that was torn up last night with the first hearing by the first right-wing coalition this generation. And therefore, no wonder 
they are angry. Since the day of Menachem Begin, the right won quite a few elections, but it didn't rule. It was unable to implement right-wing policies. Why? Because of the Supreme Court. When the right was in power and failed to drive out labor infiltrators from Africa because the Supreme Court would not allow them to do so, the left laughed and said, what do you want? Why don't you govern? You're in power. When the right was in power and failed to prevent the destruction of houses in Der Ha'avot, because which was a, a, a um, in Judea, uh, there was a crazy ruling by the Supreme Court, if you remember, that uh, uh, the area was completely fine. And then they changed the rule and decided that land that maybe was once worked by, by Arabs, even if it's not claimed by any Arab, but maybe, 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 maybe it was part that, they, that it belonged to Arabs, then we have to destroy those houses, even though there was, a, this is like a crazy ruling of the Supreme Court. So he says here, he writes, when the right was in, in power and failed to prevent the destruction of houses in Der Chavot, because the Supreme Court ruled that the Jewish homes had to be destroyed, despite the fact that there was no Arabs claiming that it was theirs, the left sneered, Enough with your whining. Why don't you govern? When the right was in power, but failed to destroy houses of Arabs in Kisufim in order to prevent terrorist attacks from these very houses. You remember there were houses in Kisufim and the Arabs the terrorists were shooting at Jews and killing Jews from those houses. The most normal thing is to bring down those houses. But who prevented it? The Supreme Court, right? You remember. So he writes here, the left laughed and said, Again, you're whining, why don't you govern? Knowing very well that as long as all the power is in the hands of the Supreme Court, the right will never be able to actually govern. That was the holy agreement. You, the right, you can win elections, but don't dare to actually govern or implement your ideology. On the other hand, the left to its credit, says Zimri, never signed an agreement when the Oslo agreements needed to be passed, all means were acceptable, even bribing Knesset members with fancy cars. When Jews had to be expelled from their homes in Gush Katif and Northern Shomron, they had no problem arresting 14-year-old girls who demonstrated, jailing them for weeks, and completely trampling, trampling the human rights of children. The Israeli right has so much to learn from the left about governance says Zimri, and he ends his article by writing, it won't be easy, and we are only at the beginning of the democratic battle. The leaders of the demonstrations are ready to burn down the club, and the right has to decide if the club is also theirs, or if it is on its way to another 40 years of, what do you want? Why are you whining? You're in power, why don't you govern? But if the elected government doesn't blink too much, it could become the first government that really will deserve the words, quote, ladies and gentlemen, a turnaround. The right has won the elections and actually plans on governing too. As Yotam writes, it won't be easy. And therefore it is very important to us, for us, the people who work so hard for this government to come to power, First of all, to strengthen them, all the people in the government. We have, there's a technology, oh, okay. We have to understand that they can't do everything at once. We can't keep on saying, no, no, no. Why didn't you do this yet? Why didn't you do this? They're only in power for a few weeks. So first we have to have patience. And when they do the right things, which are already started, we need to congratulate them. For instance, this is what we came out a few days ago. By the way, it is true, we call ourselves Women in Green for many years. We officially changed our, our or added the name the Sovereignty Movement. It's my son, really, who told me when he was 14 years old, now he's married with children, but he said, Ima, if you want us, the youth, that was many years ago, to join a, a, a move, your movement, please don't call yourself Women in Green because I'm 14 year old and I'm a boy and I'm not gonna join Women in Green. So anyway, so Women in Green is a beautiful name but we are now the sovereignty movement. 
So we wrote a few days ago uh, after the decision by the government to legalize nine uh, communities in Judea and Samaria, the sovereignty movement congratulates. The Israeli government renews a fresh Zionist spirit. Sovereignty movement congratulates the prime minister, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, and the cabinet ministers for their decision to re re uh, regularize the status of nine communities in Judea and Samaria that, with God's help, will blossom and cause the Zionist spirit to flourish for the coming generations. A new spirit is filling the land, a spirit of return to Zionist values, settlement, construction, and love for the land of Israel. Even if it is difficult to see the changes transpiring within the first few weeks since the establishment of the government, the buds are already visible. It is not easy to turn the rudder of Israel's ship rightward after years of navigating with a mistaken, naive, and dangerous belief that withdrawals and concessions are what will convince the enemy to consider us a peace-seeking people. These were years during which our concession was perceived as weakness that resulted in the strengthening of the enemy and increasing its appetite. Therefore, we welcome the steps taken by the new government that restore the people in Israel to the Zionist vision of a sovereign Jewish state in our country. Settlement and the application and exercise of sovereignty over the expanses of our country, based on a belief in the justice of our path, will make it clear to us in the world that we are a strong nation, we have a great destiny, and we are striding toward realizing that vision. May we continue to grow stronger. So on the one hand, we must strengthen the government, but on the other hand, we also know that politicians act when they feel pressure from below, from the people. So let me share with you now what our sovereignty movement is promoting. And I think that we can work together because at the end of this, we AFSI and Women in Green Sovereignty Movement, we're not about talk, we're also about doing and acting. That is what you guys are about. And that's what we are about. So there's going to be tachas at the end of our talk of what can we all do together. So just a little bit of a background for those who maybe don't know. As you know, in 1993, the Oslo agreements were signed. My dear in-laws, Ruth and Michael Matar, founded Women for Israel's Tomorrow, uh, which quickly be became Women in Green when we saw that the Oslo Accords were shrinking us down to the uh, pre-67 borders, also called the Green Line. And we had a, a campaign with Green Hat saying, don't dare shrink us back to the Green Line. And since then, the media called us Women in Green, even though we were not only women, we we're an organization of families, men, women, youth. Anyway, we were protesting them and uh, agreements which to you, I don't have to remind you, but Judith and I, we often speak to groups of youth who for them, the Oslo agreements is like something from the Middle Ages. It's so far away for them already. And they think that area A, B and C in Judea and Samaria is something since Abraham. Uh, 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 they don't even know that it, it how it was before. So let's remember what happened in 93. We had a government who brought in, who shook the hands of the mass murderer, Yasser Arafat, gave him a army, built him an army, gave him parts of Judea and Samaria, forced him and his terrorist uh, guys to become the leaders of the local Arab population against the will of the local Arabs. Um, and we were there, you guys too were there protesting from 93 to 2005. Uh, and in so many events, we were protesting together. And after the expulsion from Gush Katif and Northern Samaria, we came back to Judea. Um, I had met then uh, uh, Judith Katzover uh, exactly at that time. And my in-laws retired because of health reasons. And uh, together with Judith, uh, who by the way is one of the pioneers of the renewed Jewish settlement in Hebron, we were of course brokenhearted like all of us with what happened that summer and vote to do all we can to save Judea and Samaria. So already then in 2005, we started seeing something new in the hills around us where we live in Judea that you come to, to see so often when you come with us. We started seeing something very weird. All of the empty hills between the Jewish communities, which were meant to become the future expansion of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, all of a sudden we started seeing there fancy Arab tractors, a lot of agriculture, illegal Arab homes, signs by the uh, EU 
and the uh, uh, Oxfam USAID, you know, uh, where they were quoted as saying, we will help the Palestinian people redeem Palestinian land. All of a sudden, we started seeing with our own eyes the battle for Area C by the Salam Fayyad PA government when they understood basically that if Judea and Samaria is divided in A, B, and C, A and B is under Arab control temporarily till we'll go back, which is 40% of Judea and Samaria. In the 60% of that area, they started taking over lands in between the Jewish communities. And we decided to try to fight that by planting and by, 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 by uh, convincing to try to build more areas. But we realized very quickly that um, we were emptying the sea with a spoon. We were spending time and energy and resources in redeeming a few empty hills, which was very important and it's important to continue, while the Palestinian Authority funded with millions of dollars by the EU and others was taking over thousands of dunams with illegal Arab homes, agriculture and quarries. We, we, we understood then that we will not save Judea and Samaria if we only focus on building a bit here and a bit there. Something much more drastic is needed. And in 2011, Judith Katzover said, the time has come to do what we should have done on the sixth day of the Six Day War in 1967. As you know, again, I'm speaking to adults who still remember, and, uh, but when we talk to youth, they don't know, they barely know anything. Uh, so we remind them, and it's important for us to remind the people we speak to, that when we won, Officially, we called it a victory, the Six Day War, after the Arabs threatened to destroy Israel. And the government of Israel prepared for that war. I don't know if you remember, the, the, the government of Israel was sure that the Six Day War would be the end of Israel. The government of Israel dug 20,000 graves in the fields of Gush Dan, preparing for the massacre that will take place. I cannot even imagine, I was then one year one years old, so I cannot even imagine what the ambiance was. Now we know Israel as a strong Israel, as a big Israel, big, bigger than it was then, but, but, but how it was then. And then with God's help, there's no other explanation. Hashem sent strength to the IDF to push back the Arab enemy and return. Uh, I have no problem with the word liber li conquer, liberate. If somebody kidnaps my little daughter, then I will conquer her back. We liberated, conquered, returned to Judea, Samaria, the Golan Heights, Jerusalem, etc., and we declared victory. But it wasn't really a victory till the end, because had it been a victory, then people would not today call us occupiers or put in question our being there. But unfortunately, the government of Israel did not do one thing that they should have done, and that is declare we were just attacked, we managed to defend ourselves. According to international law, we had the right, of course, to defend ourselves. And all those areas where we return to, we are now declaring that we are going to include them as part of the state of Israel. We're going to apply Israeli law, Israeli sovereignty over all those areas that we return to, Shem, Shiloh, Betel, all those areas. And therefore, we will apply sovereignty. That was not done. Instead, as you know, the government of Israel, who was completely shocked by this victory, decided not to decide, decided to create a, a, a wing in the army called the civil administration that will administer those areas till we will decide what to do. Luckily, heroes like Rabbi Levinger and his wife and Rabbi Hanan Porat uh, 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 and his family, uh, both of them of blessed memory, and many others may they have a long life, whether it's the Katsovers, the Haetznis, the Waldmans, they, they, a group of people decided that if sometimes if the government doesn't do or doesn't know what to do, maybe we have to be the little match that will uh, direct the government in the correct direction. How does the government doesn't know? It doesn't know that we have to return and renew Jewish life in those areas where we have been here for so many thousands of years and only 19 years from 48 to 67, we weren't there. And those people created the most beautiful movement. In Hebrew, it's called the Mitnachalim. Mitnachalim in Hebrew, as you know, it has a root. Nachala means inheritance. The inheritors of the land, who in English, of course, were uh, translated in a biased way called the settlers. Because when you're a settler, it's like a biased name as if you took somebody else's land. But that little group of people 
left all they were doing. Those were not people who were staying in the kitchen waiting for a historical moment. When am I going to do something for history? No, they had lives, they had things, but they stopped everything and went to Hebron, went to Kfar Etzion, created uh, uh, the Jewish communities. And today we have half a million Jews in Judea and Samaria, thanks to the group of settlers of Mitna Khalim, uh, uh, of which, by the way, Judith Katzover was one of the 13 women in Bet Hadassah. The famous story of Beta Dasa. By the way, if anybody of you is connected to Hollywood, I think we have to make a movie about those 13 women who, for a full year, left their homes and went into Beta Dasa. That's for another uh, Zoom. Uh, a group of people who changed history and convinced the governments at the time and at the time to create Jewish communities. By the way, Kirat Arba was founded by the Labour Party. Uh, uh, Shimon Peres and, and Yigal Alon founded Kirat Arba. But what has not changed? The legal status. So no wonder that over the years, people started saying, hey, if it's not, there's no Israeli sovereignty, then is it really yours? And no wonder that all of a sudden, a group of people who up until now were individual Arabs, nomads, decided to uh, uh, invent a people called the Palestinian people, invent a narrative as if they were there forever, invent a story that it is their land, and started claiming our land as if it was theirs. And no wonder that if there's no sovereignty, and when you, when you don't apply sovereignty, you basically are stuttering and saying, maybe it's not mine. When there's no sovereignty, no wonder that the world started saying, you're occupiers. If we don't claim it's ours, how can I accuse the UN of, of, of calling me an, an occupier? And that is when in 2011, you did said, it is enough with saying no to the plan of the left. The left has a plan. The two-state solution, which we know is suicide, and we don't have to, to ask the people, we don't have to explain why the two-state solution is suicide. But up till 2011, we kept on saying no, no to the two-state solution, no to giving them weapons, no to shake the hands of Arafat. We can't go around life saying, I'm not going to be a dentist, I'm not going to be a lawyer, I'm not going to, what am I, who am I, why am I? And that is when Judith Katzover said, let's raise the flag of sovereignty. We need to push forward the plan of the right wing, which is the application of Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. And we met a lot of people who didn't even know that there's no Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. They didn't even know that the status of the Jews in Judea and Samaria is different than a Jew, than my cousin in Ramat Gan. And for 10 years, the past 10 years, we succeeded in, together, of course, with many others. And I want to say that the first person who gave us the backing and the uh, support because when we started meeting with people in our own camp to tell them about that, they were saying, why this, maybe not, maybe you should only focus on settlement, why do you need to now bring in a new issue? And I want to say, especially on this podium, I'm going to have, I'm gonna have tears in my eyes already, that the first person who believed in us and supported us was Helen Friedman, our dear Helen, who I still remember, you remember Judy? at the cafe and we were there and she said that is so true and she became our best and most amazing partner and Afsi became our most amazing partner in promoting sovereignty and afterwards others joined and Knesset members and etc everybody promoted the idea of sovereignty everybody with different plans it even reached the White House uh, but somebody there messed things around by including a Palestinian state intertwined with sovereignty which obviously could not be accepted. And thus, here we are in 2023, finally with a right-wing government that actually wants to rule. So what can we do now? After a lot of thinking and meetings, we decided in the sovereignty movement that we understand that we cannot do what we wish we could do. Hocus pocus, let's have sovereignty between the Jordan River and the sea right away tomorrow. It's not gonna be able to happen we understand that on the other hand we have to do something what is the first step that should be done and after a lot of thinking a lot of meetings we decided that the very first step that needs to be done is sovereignty over the jordan valley first and we put the emphasis on first because of course god gave us all of Eretz israel and we want all of Eretz israel and sovereignty will be over all of Eretz israel but sometimes you have to do it in stages why the Jordan Valley first? So first of all, of course, because it's ours. That is where uh, uh, the people entered Eretz Israel. Uh, uh, um, obviously, also according to the international law. But first of all, it's ours because God gave us to us. 
in the Jordan Valley is 30% of Judea and Samaria. 30% of Judea and Samaria is the Jordan Valley. 90% of the Jordan Valley is area C, meaning under Israeli control. It is the longest border, so it's our Eastern border. There's, uh, as I said, it's 30% of Judea and Samaria. There's very few Arabs. So this whole question of what's gonna be with the Arabs after we apply sovereignty, which is a very big question, is not uh, an issue in uh, uh, the, the Jordan Valley because in the Jordan Valley, there is without Jericho, something like 15,000 Arabs, which is not a lot. And the most important thing of why the Jordan Valley first is the consensus. Consensus on the right and on the left about how about the importance of application of Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley. And last week, we started with a um, very special program where we held a tour and a discussion, a conference, a mini conference in the Jordan Valley to get, and it was very, it, what was amazing was simultaneously when the media, the mainstream media was trying to say that there's a war, a civil war in Israel and showing the demonstrators, we were having our event with extreme left-wing people like Yoel Marshak or uh, 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 Avram Katzoz from the Labour Party who was speaking at our conference at the same table as us, you did, uh, and, and, and Yesha leaders, all together promoting the application of Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley first. And uh, um, I urge you to go afterwards into our website. You can see the, the, the um, summaries of the um, event. And we started the event with a video of Bibi Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, both promising the application of Israeli sovereignty before the previous elections. So it is an issue that finally we can say we are all united around the need for the future of Israel to apply Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. I will finish by saying two more things and then I will, I'll be very happy to have questions. Our next step uh, in this issue is um, the creation of a lobby in the Knesset for the sovereignty over the Jordan Valley first. We're very happy to announce that two Knesset members have agreed to become the leaders of uh, uh, this Knesset lobby. We're talking about MK Dan Iluz, who I'm sure you, you know, you heard of. He was the ZOA representative in, Amer in Israel. He's a great guy. He doesn't stop. Every second word by him is sovereignty. So that's Danny Luz from the Likud. And amazingly and very happily, we can happily uh, announce that also Yosef Tayeb from Shas uh, uh, will be heading this Knesset lobby together with Dan Iluz. And if you happen to be in the country when uh, uh, they will officially launch, you know, you have an official event in the Knesset when you launch such a lobby and then people are invited. Judy, if you'll be in the country, I don't know yet, I don't have a date yet, but we'll be very happy for you to come too because you guys are full partners. I will already answer a question that I'm sure you will, people will ask, so I will preempt it. How can you even think about doing those things if America will not agree? Uh, will you be able to do such a thing? Look at the noise the Americans and the Europeans did just for nine Jewish communities that already exist, that were, that were legalized. And look at how many condemn condemnations. The answer is with all due respect, Israel needs to do what is good for Israel. And I think you all know our dear friend, Yoram Ettinger, who always reminds us that there has been many, many instances where Israel did things that the USA did not like and opposed, and they did it anyway. And the next day the sun rose and life continued. Whether it was Ben-Gurion in 1948 who declared the state of Israel against the US uh, uh, okay. Whether it was Levi Eshkol in 67 who applied sovereignty over Jerusalem, by the way, as you know. And in 1981, Menachem Begin who applied sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Are you saying Yiddish? Nish so yes, so they, they, they shouted, they screamed. Uh, uh, as Geula Cohen said at the time, when they applied sovereignty over Jerusalem, and she was one of the people who brought it to the Knesset, and people were calling her the day before, saying, um, Geula, uh, 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 the world is going to leave us, and embassies are going to leave Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. 
She says, I rather have them leave to Tel Aviv and I'll be in Jerusalem, don't worry. So, so uh, um, the answer to that is that America needs to do, uh, Israel needs to do what is good for Israel and America needs to respect Israel's democracy. There has been elections now, an overwhelming majority won, we have 64 seats. And also um, some people say we are so dependent on America so I refer you to the excellent article by, uh, by um, Joram Ettinger again. But for, what about foreign aid? So just one sentence, and with that I will finish. Foreign aid to Israel, a billion dollar bonanza for the US, says Joram Ettinger in the Jewish Times on June 10th, 2022. Just one sentence. The US does not give foreign aid to Israel. The US makes an annual investment in Israel one that provides the American taxpayer a return on investment of several hundred percent. And I urge you to read and continue the article. And he finishes by saying, giving many examples of how we are providing the Americans with so much information, so much important assets that it's, it's worth millions of dollars. And he finishes the article by saying, the US-Israel strategic relationship constitutes a classic case of mutually beneficial two-way street, one that enhances the economies and defense of both countries and benefits Israeli and American taxpayers alike. So we don't have to be too afraid at all to implement what the majority of the Jewish people wants. I will finish by saying what can be done. I think that the first thing, if there's like dozens of people here on this Zoom, the very first thing you can do tomorrow morning or even today is to strengthen Yariv Levin, Simcha Rotman, and also the prime minister, and urge them to, prom to apply Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley, halavai over all of Judea and Samaria, but let's start with the Jordan Valley, to promote that, to continue to push that. We, we will spread articles about the importance of it, forward it to others, become messengers of sovereignty, because in the end, the politicians will act if they feel a lot of pressure. Um, that's it for now, and you can um, open it for questions. Thank you so much, Nadia. Uh, there was so much information in there. I think uh, many people may feel that their the questions they had were answered in your in your talk. Um, but I think Helene, you you had a, a question that um, we can start off with. Um, I think. Thank you very much for that. And um, I, I would also um, might add to the next thing you can do after you you give your support to Rothman and Netanyahu um, is to call your senators of course. And, and let them know that um, they're absolutely wrong in supporting the American State Department's um, anti-Israel slant. Um, my my question, you covered most of what I was going to ask, but my question is, while, while the Americans continue to treat Israel as almost like a satellite, you know, uh, Nides said, like I tell my children, um, there's, there's obviously the ju judiciary reform is, is part of getting sovereignty pushed through. There's, I, th I believe that one might hinge on the other because they'll, you know, the court will say no and then, and then everything's up in the air again. But the question really is, how will Israelis perceive the potential withdrawal of support from the United States? We already saw last week, they, they didn't veto the UN Security Council um, uh, so I think that there is a potential for impact, but how do the Israelis perceive it? How will the Israelis perceive it? Um, the Israelis will, will see and be disappointed by people who call themselves our friends and allies, um, allying with Israel's enemy. And anybody who is an enemy of Israel is an enemy really of the United States. Let's remember that uh, one of the main slogans by the Arabs is first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. First, we get rid of Israel, and then we go on to Europe and America. And uh, the we will just wait and sit and, and, and make sure that you guys make sure that uh, 
another government comes into power very soon, in less than two years, a government uh, um, led by Republicans that will that knows to be on Israel's side and knows what is good for the Western world, because the war that is taking care that is taking place here is not about this piece of land or that piece of land. It's about two world views. It's about those who want to keep the Western values of, that we believe in, you guys in America and we here in Israel. Uh, the Bible, whatever you, uh, America was founded on on, 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 on the biblical values. And there are people who want to stop that, to, to destroy that, whether it's the uh, uh, um, extreme Islam and, and, their, and their allies. And therefore, people have to choose whether they're on the side of Israel and the Americans who want to help Israel or on the side of the enemies. And I think that we Israelis, we are strong. And the overwhelming majority here in Israel said that they want a Jewish state, that they want sovereignty, that they want, uh, uh, um, and by the way, I have something that very important. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, uh, something I forgot to say in my talk. We have many Arabs with us in our sovereignty movement, or at least those who support us from the outside because they cannot, or are scared to come on camera because they like to have their heads still on their shoulder the next day. And therefore, so many Arabs we meet, and some of them are really um, he heroes in being able to talk. Basem Eid from Jericho, Sheikh Tamimi from Ramallah, Sheikh Jabri from Hebron, are people who are not afraid to say, we rather be residents under Israeli sovereignty than citizens in an Islamo-fascist Arab state, and we don't want a Palestinian state. Will you stop forcing upon us a Palestinian state that is the most immoral act? We don't want our wives to go around and, and with the, 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 that schmatter on their heads. And we don't want the, uh, uh, um, uh, our children that if God forbid they might uh, um, uh, steal, that their hands will be uh, uh, cut away by a Hamas-like uh, government. So, so when we say sovereignty, we say responsibility and we say a better life for all of us, also the Arabs, who of course have to understand that they have to be loyal to the state of Israel as a Jewish state. The, the axioma of sovereignty means an Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people with an overwhelming Jewish majority and a non-Jewish minority that will accept Israel as a Jewish state and that will be loyal to the Jewish state, and that will understand that they can live by us as individuals, but not will never receive between the sea and the Jordan River will never receive any national rights. Any Arab who is not happy with that, we will help him to move. Uh, uh, there's no, we're not going to force Arabs to live by us if they don't want to. So that is uh, more or less a, a larger answer to your question. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Um, next question from Pesach Rogaway. Looking at the situation as objectively as possible and forgetting their motivation, do the demonstrators have any case at all? If so, what are the two or three issues that bother them the most? And what are your rebuttals? He's also asking, has some important legislation le legislation passed already? What are some of the laws that have passed at least first reading in the Knesset? And have any in the opposition uh, MKs voted for anything? I know that you had uh, Sharon Haskell at your panel discussion, which was very nice to see that somebody from the opposition was, was uh, agreeing about the Jordan Valley. But um, how, well, how, has it been, how has the voting been going in the Knesset? OK, so. Uh... Basically, yesterday, two sections of the legal reform of justice. No, for the first to answer about those who have, do they have a claim? Uh, and then I'll tell you what really happened yesterday. Do they have a claim? Most of um, the people are fed with lies and disinformation by the media, who basically in one line are saying that we are turning into a dictatorship, which is, I'm not going to use the word on a formal uh, uh, Zoom, but uh, uh, nonsense. We'll use the word nonsense. Complete nonsense. It's where it, we used to live for the over 20 years in a dictatorship of the Supreme Court. And now we're trying to bring back democracy. That is what really is uh, happening. 
So I printed out, and I want to say thank you to Israel Shili, who sent it uh, as, uh, 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 in Hebrew again, what exactly happened yesterday, uh, um, so that we understand what's going on. Yesterday, two sections of the legal reform of Justice Minister Yariv Levin and Constitution Committee Chairman Simcha Rotman were passed. They were only passed on the first reading, the first of three. So what is in them? Number one, the first change is a change in the composition of the committee for the selection of judges, so that it is more balanced and logical than what currently exists. And the second one, the second change, is the anchoring of the status of the basic laws so that the Supreme Court cannot cancel them or empty them of their content. So let's talk about the first change, about the change in the composition of the committee of the selection of judges. Up until now, somebody made a beautiful movie about it, judges basically chose themselves who can be a judge and, and, and it was always the same branja as we call it, all the same people. So what is the composition of the current committee for selecting judges? Nine representatives, two government representatives, two Knesset members, two representatives of the Bar Association, and three Supreme Judges. So to and, and to appoint a Supreme Judge, you needed a majority of seven out of nine. So what happened? The distortion that happened, when the right was in power, usually the majority of the, it was always six against three. When the left was in power, it was eight against one, in favor, of course, always of the left, of leftist judges. So what is the lineup that was approved yesterday in the first reading? It will still be nine representatives, but this time will be three government representatives and three Knesset members, two from the coalition and one from the opposition, and three Supreme judges. And also a simple majority is required to, appreme, to appoint a Supreme judge as they write here in Israel Shali, it's not perfect, but it improves the current situation dramatically. So that is about the first change. The second change about the basic rules, what Rotman and Levine sought to do was to anchor the status of our fundamental laws. In fact, during the Aaron Barak, he's the one who changed, who did the real revolutions in the 20s, and then 20 years ago, the High Court of Justice turned our basic laws into a, some kind of constitution on its own accord, and the court is not, supposed, is not supposed to touch the constitution. So why was it so important for Levine and, uh, and, um, and no, what's his name, uh, um, Rotman to, uh, um, to anchor the basic laws? Because in the recent years, the high court has taken judicial activism one step further and allowed themselves to interfere with the basic laws as well. And something that is unheard of in any Western country. So again, they're saying, is it perfect? No, but for, for basic laws to be truly supreme, they should be accepted in a more fixed procedures than they are today. But this is the first step on the road to repair. So basically, what is next? The law passed on the first hearing, reading. The road to their approval is still long. Now the laws will return to lengthy discussions in the Knesset's Constitution Committee and then go up for a second and third reading in the Knesset. There's still a long way to go, but progress was definitely made yesterday. And yes, there is room for conversation. And yes, to this lady who asked, maybe some things here and there have to be changed. But uh, uh, as a general idea, as a general reform, it is good for all of us for the country, for the society, and therefore we must make sure that this reform will pass. Thank you. Um, Pauline Rosenberg has asked, since Israel- I'm sorry, is hi, I see here with Fern Hassan, I say hi to Fern also. I recognize some names, so it's yeah, possible not to mention all of Fern you. Fern has a comment and we have, we have many, many questions here. Uh -huh. <laughs> and many, many uh, familiar and, and friendly faces, friendly names. Um, Paul, Paulie, <laughs> Pauline Rosenberg says, since Israel doesn't have a written uh, constitution, how does the Supreme Court make its judgments? Okay, I, I want to say something. I'm not an expert on, I think you should have a separate Zoom on the entire issue with, uh, obviously Simcha Rotman is a little bit busy now, but he has an organization and because uh, um, I don't, I like to talk about things I really know well. Okay. And all the, the legal, the legal stuff, 
is for a lawyer to for you to explain in a very good way so if you uh, ask for a Kohelet or if you ask uh, um, uh, Simcha Otman as a partner and I forgot his name now and you should invite him for a Zoom just on that. We did have Simcha Rotman about a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, and if anybody wants to go on our YouTube channel, he's, he explains very, very, very clearly what he wanted to do and he's carrying out what his plan was. Um, Leon said- Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear Leon, me? I can hear you. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> he I'll figured be... out how to unmute himself. Go ahead, Leon. Okay, Nadia, first of all, uh, call it. Why don't I see you? My, I can't figure out my camera. <laughs> you know, I, I bought a new one, but that's for another day. First Guys, of all, Leon call... and Judy, uh, they're such great partners. It's great to hear for, uh, to, great to hear you. And uh, like I mentioned, call it to you and Yehudas for your work on the Jordan Valley event. And I encourage everyone to go to your website, YouTube, it's a uh, it's a very important item. So since I have a microphone, two things. First, your impressions on uh, an Israeli Jew, um, a former general, the former Minister of Defense, uh, Benny Gantz, on his last day in office, ordered the destruction of Jewish homes. That's number one. Uh, number two is, can you give us your impressions on the relationship between a Supreme Court hearing a case against Etam? And what's the status of that now? Given who? That, I didn't hear. Can you hear me? Against who? Wait. Uh, Etam, e uh, the new... Uh, 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 Etam? Etam, okay. Etam okay. in Efrat. Yes, yes. And how, uh, why the Supreme Court would even consider hearing a case, uh, given that uh, area areas A and B, uh, Arabs can build their, uh, at their will. Okay, I'll be quiet and let you answer. Well, I'll first, I'll start. I didn't understand the first uh, question. What was the question about Benny Gantz? Benny Gantz is Benny Gantz, and... Uh... And uh, he ordered the destruction of homes. What's, what's the question about that? That's who he is. That's who, like, like what, what, what's the question? But about number two, it's also that uh, Leon, we were just discussing the fact that the Supreme Court, instead of doing what it's supposed to do to judge cases of uh, different cases, they, they, over the last few years, got involved into policies, got involved into... Uh, uh, deciding whether this land is ours or not, got involved in all kinds of issues that are completely not dealt with in any normal country by the Supreme Court. And also the story of the Etam Hill uh, um, in, uh, in um, Efrat. Um, but by the, by the way, there's no yet uh, final conclusions to it. So it's, let's not open our mouth and let's hope that with all the changes that are taking place now, we will be able to uh, host you in Efrat in the Etam as a flourishing Jewish community, like we did with the other hills and fought and won. So let's keep that on the back burner and pray that uh, the Etam will continue to become uh, one of the largest hills of the Efrat community. Um, great, great answer. Can't wait to, to uh, meet you in Etam. Uh, Shereen, By the way, Helen also was there with us and planted there too in the in the rain. I, you know, I, I remember those videos. I remember those videos. It was uh, quite, a, and they were being pulled out as as you were planting. People mm -hmm. were coming and pulling them out. So, um, are there any? Sherry Bolaker says, "Do not listen to the American government." Are there any left or middle of the road Knesset members who would also agree to be in the sovereignty lobby? Well, I didn't. I, I was. I was reading the chat. That was not good. I heard the <laughs> question again. Yes, it's okay. What What she had asked was: Are there any people who are in the of uh, in the minority coalition who would agree to be in the sovereignty lobby? Oh yeah, definitely. We already. Oh, I I forgot to mention it. We, uh, Judith and I, are spending 
two days a week or sometimes one day a week in the Knesset, meaning uh, uh, Sharon Haskell, who we, you just mentioned, was the first one we met because she's the one who already wrote down a law the, uh, um, to, uh, for the Jordan Valley, and she's on board with us. And I will update. We're having a lot of meetings. I don't know how many people want to be public or not. We're at the, uh, when we're going to uh, launch the Knesset lobby, you will see that indeed we have quite a few people who are uh, also from the opposition who will vote for the Jordan Valley. I mean, this should pass with, with at least 80 votes with no problem. If they vote ideologically, and if they don't do, you know, they don't mess around with politics, I'm not gonna vote because I wanna bother something else. If they vote according to ideology and their beliefs that the Jordan Valley must have sovereignty, we can have 80 people too. So uh, Mark Karoff has a question about the youth of Israel being ignorant of the history of Judea and Samaria. I thought this was a good opening to for you to talk about the sovereignty youth movement because it has been such a success. And obviously your sovereignty youth have been educated about all of this. Uh, and you've been amazingly successful in, in having uh, the youth come forward and, and make this something important to them. We, a few years ago, we got, it was really a godsend. It's a, really from Hashem. We were we were saying up till a few years ago that uh, we also had a friend who told us, an, an organization, uh, you know, what happens when you and you did retire? Is there a continuation? We said, we, he's right, we need youth. And we were thinking about that a lot. How do we even start? Uh, I remember, you know, working with Judith Katzover is always looking and striving for better. So we were at a big conference that we organized in Jerusalem. There were 1,200 people there. And I was like, so happy. I said, yeah, look, 12. He says, yeah, but look at the age. Where's the youth? We need youth. Anyway, then something happened. We got a phone call from um, youth after the Derecha Avot destruction of the homes. Uh, that terrible uh, uh, destruction there. The youth called us. Did we reach the sovereignty movement? Yes, we want to talk to you. We're sick and tired of you guys calling us every time there's an uprooting. You're telling us to demonstrate. But we finally understood the way it works. And had there been sovereignty, there wouldn't have been a, a destruction because if there is some uh, construction problems, you solve it in other ways when, it's, when there is sovereignty. You don't just have the Supreme Court order a destruction and, and, and give the land to who? To, uh, to Arabs who don't even claim it. We want to join the sovereignty movement and we want to create a, a, a part of the sovereignty movement, a, youth, a, 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 a sovereignty youth uh, movement. We said, wow, it's like God sent us this. And uh, we met with them, they were very serious. And to make a long story short, we, we said to them, what do you want, what do you need? Give us stickers, give us uh, uh, paper, uh, flyers and we will hand them out all around the country. They got organized. After a few weeks, and we get, we provided them with stickers and T-shirts and everything they wanted, they called us back, and they said we went into the streets of Israel, and we didn't have enough knowledge to answer their questions. Please arrange for us a seminar so that we are, so that we can learn what the what to answer, and because we need the knowledge. Because unfortunately, this is I'm saying in brackets, the Israeli school system doesn't teach our youth the basic facts about our right to this land, which is terrible. But at least they were aware of it and wanted and asked for seminars. That's when we started our first seminar and then a, a conference. And to make a long story short, as you said, we are a few years later, one of our youth who was one of the founders of the youth movement is now a parliamentary aide to one of the Knesset members because they're all very involved politically. So they are striving to go up and up and to become our future leaders. We have uh, representatives all around the country uh, in most of the yeshivas, in most of the schools, I must be very upfront with you, it's mostly religious youth. Yeah. We're trying to reach secular youth and we have a few somewhere in high five, but not enough, I'm being very upfront. Uh, um, and the next thing that we're doing is also uh, bringing them to the Jordan Valley and they have, every, they have weekly activities, but it's mostly Hasbara, and in the beginning it was hard to explain to them. They said to us, okay, what do we do? What do we do? We say, you go out and you promote an idea. 
It's very hard for a youth. It's much easier to give him a tool and say, start building a home or start, uh, I don't know. Uh, but here, finally, we created a, youth, a group of youth who understood that they have to be on the social media. They have to be there. Now they're doing podcasts. And little by little, we're growing the next generation. It's not easy. And it's all thanks to uh, all our partners, et cetera. And uh, we hope to continue and grow them even more. Mm. It's it's something that every organization should take you should take you as a model. I will say we've reached two o'clock. Um, Nadia, if you care to stay on, we can unmute everybody and and let them ask. I will stay on just questions. to say hi and to give us a, just we have a, a new website, not a new website, but uh, we used to put to. Uh, we have a website, uh, uh, the Sovereignty website, it's Hebrew and English, so it's ribonut.co.il. Ribonut in Hebrew means sovereignty, it's uh, R-I-B-O-N-U-T dot C-O dot I-L, and you click on English, and there you'll see, um, hi Sherry, you're welcome from California. Um, you will see all the articles, and you can be in touch with us, and again, the most important thing is that each and one of us that's what I'm learning from Judith Katzover. We have to learn from all the activists. Uh, uh, um, each and one of us, we can we can change things. And if we end this Zoom by all of us committing to promote uh, uh, the, the sovereignty over the Jordan Valley first, uh, when if you call your uh, uh, um, your yeah, politicians, yeah. and also if you contact the politicians in Israel, they know you. They know Afsi. Every, you don't know what influence every email, every letter has. And let's work on this together, AFSI and the Sovereignty Movement. And please God, we will succeed. Absolutely, together. Um, so I just want to close this part of the formal, uh, formal uh, Zoom by asking everybody who's on this call, or on this Zoom, to be an ambassador tell at least two friends what you heard, what you understand, get the word out, and please do what, what we, we will send out some information about what you can, who you can call, what you can say, what we will, we will do that. Our, our newsletter that comes out tomorrow will have that information in it. And, um, and please be active, be active and, uh, and be well. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you everybody.